So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL Lunch Hour Lecture on Improving Survival for Men with Prostatic Cancer by Improving Clinical Trials and Meta-Analysis. Our speaker today is the very distinguished uh, Max Palmer. Max is Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology and Director of both the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL and the Institute of Clinical Trials and Methodology at University College London. From 2001 to 2012, Max was the Associate Director of the National Cancer Research Network, an organisation that has more than double the number of patients going to clinical trials in England. Max joined the MRC in 1987. Before we get, begin, I want to let you know that we'll have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, and these can be submitted at any point during Max's talk by going to Slido. If you enter Slido into your internet browser and the event code is hashtag prostate cancer, hashtag prostate cancer, all one word, no space, hashtag prostate cancer. I'll now hand over to Max for his talk. Max, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, David. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation. In this talk, I'll be talking about how we have looked to improve clinical trials, particularly to improve, in the example that I would give, survival for men with prostate cancer, but also more uh, broadly and, and more globally as well. So just to give you a sense of the outline of the talk, I'll be talking first a little bit about clinical trials, the, the need for them, just an introduction. I know many of you here will not need too much of an introduction, but also more, more particularly, the need to make them more efficient, how we might make them more efficient, particularly using the multi-arm, multi-stage platform design, give you the example in prostate cancer, some challenges that we've had to deal with and how we've dealt with them in, in forming this uh, collaboration and this uh, project. Uh, and then uh, some examples of some of the next steps that we're taking. Uh, I'll come with some brief conclusions and then uh, take some questions. So firstly, probably I should point out that clinical trials are almost unique in nature um, in that they, they are one of the few areas of science that have a, an opportunity to have a direct impact on patient care or health care the very few areas of science that have that ability to have a direct impact on patient care or health care. Two examples that I can give to you are uh, in prostate cancer, the use of the drug chemotherapy, uh, the use of the chemotherapy drug docetaxel uh, was immediately used after the results from clinical trials. And more recently, and many of you will be aware of the, the drug, the steroid dexamethasone being shown in the recovery trial uh, being effective for the treatment of COVID-19 came into immediate use after that result. So as a consequence of this direct potential impact on patient care, we have to be very careful about how we conduct and report and design trials. We have to show particularly that the new treatment is sufficiently safe, it's effective, and also worth uh, the cost that we're paying out for it. And they're simple barriers to put up or simple hurdles to put up, but actually quite challenging to achieve. What we have to show and provide evidence of that the new treatment is a real cause for the improvement in, in patient outcomes. And we do that by a number of means. We do randomized trials. A lot of you will be familiar with the concept of randomization now because uh, uh, trials have been uh, widely in the literature in the, uh, uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. We try and ensure that we're unbiased in how we assess things. So assessments are made blind to the treatment uh, that patients are on. We have this concept of a fair test, which randomized trials do for you. And those who are younger in this, uh, 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 in this audience will have come across this in their uh, GCSEs and O-levels, uh, the, the idea of a fair test. And we spend a lot of time on designing trials to ensure that they are uh, give us unbiased 
and clear evidence that the new treatment is a real cause for the improvement, not some other uh, component of treatment. So as a consequence, the integrity of the design, the conduct and the uh, data collected from trials is really very, very key. And the, the results, the conduct and the data from trials is poured over by many organizations once a trial is reported by regulators such as the MHRA in the UK and the EMEA in, in Europe and the FDA in, in the States, uh, organizations such as NICE who look over the data and thousands of others nationally and internationally whenever you publish a major trial result. So you've got to make sure that what you've done has integrity in terms of its design, its conduct, and its, uh, its data and its results. As a consequence, trials tend to be randomized trials that really make a difference to practice, tend to be very large, many hundreds, often thousands of patients and participants, and involve many organizations and hospitals in their collaboration. These are large scale endeavors. And so in, in some ways, what you could call them is big science. And as a consequence, they, they cost a lot of money. Uh, pharma industry will typically on a randomized phase three trial spend many hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, uh, and academia, at least in the UK, it's difficult to get an exact figure how, how much these things cost because the cost is distributed across a range of organizations. But a reasonable guess would be that they would cost somewhere in the region of five to 10 million per large scale randomized trial. So you can see these are very large scale uh, endeavors. Uh, and unfortunately, despite all that um, uh, input and finance, we still find the development and testing process for new therapies is too slow. One of the major challenges we find is that large trials, which are comparing a new intervention against a control or a standard treatment, often shows that the new is not better than the standard treatment. And a, a rough figure of the likely success rate of that randomized large-scale phase three trial is of the order of 40 to 50%, no better than tossing a coin when you set off on the journey, spending a lot of time, a lot of energy, huge numbers of people, large numbers of participants, and a lot of money to find actually your new intervention is no better than your standard. And, and we know that in many diseases, we've made little or slow, very slow progress over many years. I'll just give you one example, Parkinson's disease. Many of us will be familiar with patients with Parkinson's disease or know somebody with Parkinson's disease. A uh, very common disease uh, nationally and internationally. And this graphic, uh, which I borrowed from Tom Fortney, uh, uh, at the Institute of Neurology at UCL shows you the, the, the sequence of uh, uh, treatments which have been evaluated for Parkinson's disease. Um, the, the, the slightly brown block, blocks show you the studies which have been done early on there at the early phase trials. The yellow blocks tells you subsequently the randomized phase three trials. And you can see after the randomized phase three trials, none of those treatments have been shown to be effective or successful in uh, affecting the course of the Parkinson's disease. In fact, we have no treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease which modify the course of that disease. The treatments that we do have are all symptomatic treatments, and you can see a number of them listed on the right-hand side. So despite 20 years of effort, a range of treatments being evaluated there and developed and evaluated, we've made little or no progress in the treatment of, uh, of this disease in terms of trying to modify the disease process. So we need new designs and new approaches to improve our trials. We need um, to respond to the challenge. We have to think that the landscape for evaluation of treatment has changed. If we look back 15 or 20 years, it, uh, there were relatively few new treatments coming through to evaluate. Actually, that's changed. The biological revolution um, in the lab has been, meant that many new treatments 
are needing to be evaluated in, in some of our diseases. And that's particularly true, for example, in TB, in cancer, uh, and many of other of our major diseases. And we know the process of developing and starting a new randomized trial is very time consuming. There's a time taken just to do the trial, which is long in itself, but also the time taken between trials is very long. Often there's a two year hiatus between trials. And so we need a step change. We can't tinker around the edges here. We need a step change in how we design our trials and, uh, and evaluate our treatments. And about when we were thinking about this now, over 20 years ago, this was the sort of challenge we were faced, that we would have a control therapy and we'd have a number of therapies that we would want to potentially test to see if they were better than control or could we add them to the control therapy to improve outcomes. And this is what we would traditionally have done, taken treatment arbitrarily often, taken treatment A and tested it against control, often got a negative result what's often called a negative result, showing that treatment A is no better than control. Moved on to treatment B after a, a gap, probably of a number of years, moved on to treatment B, equally shown that that doesn't work. And then hopefully moved on to treatment C some years later, tested that against control and seen that that hopefully did work. That could take decades to do. A quite simple idea in concept uh, is, could we have actually set out on the control immediately and have treatment A, B and C lined up um, uh, all against the common control and introduce a new treatment, say treatment D, when it's ready to be introduced. At each stage, that's the multi-arm nature, and then the various stages, at each at various stages, we compare uh, treatment A against control, treatment B against control, treatment C against control, to see whether there's any value in carrying on evaluating that therapy when compared to control, to see uh, whether there's evidence of sufficient activity to justify randomizing further patients. If there isn't, we then, stop in this example, treatment B, carry on with treatment A and treatment C. And then at a subsequent stage, perhaps drop treatment A, subsequent stop treatment C, and then have also introduced treatment D uh, during the course of that trial. And hopefully, and this uh, schematic shown that treatment D is successful. You can see how that is much more efficient and actually, even though treatment A, B, and C have started all at the same time, with treatment D starting later, at least in principle, B, C could have started later. They don't need to all start at the same time. One way of thinking of this design is just a very efficient way of running those two-arm trials, which we're showing at the bottom of this slide, in a very efficient way. It's just A versus C, B versus C, B, so A versus control, B versus control, C versus control, and D versus control. And it's much more efficient in time, and of course, much more efficient in patients, because you've only got one control group. So that's where the phrase multi-arm, multi-stage platform trials comes from. The advantage are it's faster, it's, there's a reduced cost, facilitates recruitment, and we can pick up why that might be the case in, in the Q&A, and you can drop and add treatments in the way I've described. Let's give you an example of this. Worldwide, there are about a, just nearly a million and a half new prostate cancers a year. When we started thinking about the Stampede trial in 2000, about 20 years ago now, Hormone therapy was the prime treatment for patients with high risk disease. There was no change in treatment for 40 years and median survival was around three to five years. For men with metastatic disease, M1 patients, it was three years. For men with locally advanced disease and high risk, it was a bit longer. So we started this MAMS multi-arm multi-stage platform trial in prostate cancer in 2005. We termed it Stampede. 
is now 17 years old, and this is how it's turned out. Here you can see on the, at the, at the, the same sort of schematic that I've shown you, the control arm, which is A, research arms that we started with, the five research arms that we started with, B through to F, so we have six arms in total, one control arm, five research arms, B through to F, zoledronic acid, which is a uh, bisphosphonate, a chemotherapy docetaxel, and a COX-2 inhibitor, which is celecoxib, and then combinations thereof. The green um, bars show you the cruel period that we were going from 2005 up till about 2013. The dots show you a follow-up period where we're further following our patients, and the blobs at the end, the black blobs at the end, was the time point that we would analyze the data. So you can see the time point for analysis of these trials were around two, these arms, the original arms were at 2015, uh, but arms D and F were stopped early because they, they were insufficiently active when compared to A to justify further randomization of patients. So they stopped early. Arms B, C, and E continued to their full accrual, their full follow-up and reported in 2015. Along the way from 2011 onwards, up to 2017, we added a further five new arms. And in the next sort of epoch of this trial, we're adding further arms. So over that 17 year period, what we've done is evaluated 10 new agents or new interventions. We've randomized 12,000 participants at more, more than 120 hospitals around the country. The big output though, is there's been five, as a consequence of the results of Stampede, there've been five changes in standard of care. And we've improved survival for men with metastatic disease as a consequence directly of the results of Stampede and with other trials which have reported in contemporaneously along the way with results from Stampede from three years where we started for patients with metastatic disease now to seven years. What we've done in that 17 year period, we've tested 10 interventions in uh, over that 17 year period, including the follow up that takes us to 20 years. We've evaluated a chemotherapy agent, radiotherapy, hormone therapies, the COX-2 inhibitor, bisphosphonates and metformin. It's a mix of repurposed and commercial drugs under, pa under patent that we've evaluated. And now as a consequence, not only have we had, uh, well, four changes in standard of care from Stampede and one change outside of Stampede. That's where the five came from. And we, but also as a consequence of the building of this infrastructure, we have a new result emerging every 12 to 18 months from Stampede. So we're changing standards of care probably every two years now and improving outcomes at that rate. That shows you an example of the power of this sort of uh, approach. And it, it shows you that actually over that 20 year period, we've been able to change not only the treatment of patients, but most importantly, the outcome of patients with this horrible disease. Actually, what we've also done is show that if you think of any other way we could have done that, if you think of the two arm trials, that would have taken us probably two generations to do, not 20 years. We've also shown that actually most of these designs, you can test many interventions, many of them are new, but many of them are repurposed. And that the pharmaceutical industry is not going to do these sorts of designs because they are really interested in their single treatment for a given disease. They don't often have many treatments that are competing for evaluation of the, uh, the for a, uh, effectiveness in a given disease. They're only interested in their single treatment. So academia is uniquely placed to do such trials and experience supports this. 
This plot here shows you on the right-hand side, uh, the MAMS platform trials that have been done uh, uh, subsequent to Stampede. There are more than 50 there on that right-hand side, including a number of the COVID-19 trials uh, and the recovery trial is a variation of this multi-arm, multi-stage platform trial. There are, though, I've made it sound very easy. I'll just have a look at the time. Uh, I made it sound very easy, but there are some significant practical and strategic challenges in doing this little trial and some design and statistical challenges. I'll talk, given the audience today, I'll talk mainly about the practical and strategic challenges and not too much about the design and statistical ones. Firstly, this is a very big endeavor. As I said, 12,000 participants, 120 hospitals over a 17 year period. Um, firstly, what you have to gather is the research and investigators on board to, to start this sort of design and get started on the journey. Of course, what you find is not everybody that jumps on board. Actually, you don't need everybody. You just need enough to get started. And what we found actually, inevitably, not everybody buys into these trials. Um, it, they think, and there's a reasonable argument to be made that actually what this sort of study does, it corners the market of trials in high-risk prostate cancer and doesn't give others to a look in. That is a challenge, of course, but the prize of making progress and making progress quickly and in our lifetimes is so large that that probably is worth it to put a few noses out of joint to achieve that goal. And what we found actually is when we discuss this sort of design with patients and patient groups, they are key in the development, design, funding, and conduct and reporting of those trials. They understand that actually if we come together as a, a national group of, of, of uh, researchers and uh, work together rather than against each other uh, or doing our own studies, we can make much more progress and much faster progress. They have been the biggest supporters of these sorts of designs, and they have been key to getting through funding and review hurdles, who, if I'm honest, have often been very conservative in their nature of how they might look at these sorts of designs. One approach that we've used, which has been helpful, is that for each new comparison, for each new arm, and remember we have had 10 of them in Stampede, we've had a new clinical investigator leading that arm. And so a national call has gone out for new research arms and for new research clinical investigators, which opens the tent out to as many people as possible. Despite that, there are always, of course, challenges in, in, um, in running such large collaborations. There's also funding challenges. Those who know how funding bodies work, typically a single funder will give you three to five years of funding, perhaps two to three million pounds as an envelope of funding for your trial. But of course, Stampede has been running for 17 years and has cost ten, many tens of millions. What we've done is combine funding from many research uh, uh, funders, both Charities, Cancer Research UK, government funders such as the MRC, but also our industry partners such as Pfizer, Novartis, and many others. And anybody thinking of getting these things off the ground is the hardest thing is to get started. So get started with at least two research arms because you've then got a, a multi-arm trial already. Specify that you're going to add arms, go with a single funder, and start with repurposed agents. And I'll talk about repurposed agents in a moment. They've got a, a bad press, actually, and what? And I'll talk a little bit in a, in, a, in a moment why I think you need to start with them. Part of the reason for starting with them is you're not then dependent on the pharmaceutical industry providing you with their agent. If they're doing that at the beginning of a trial, they may, accept, they may expect quite a lot from the trial and may actually require you to design that trial in ways that are not appropriate for an academic trial. And you don't want that level of interference and that level of control at that stage. 
and we'll come back to some of these issues. Also, in terms of choosing the research interventions, what you want to do is make them as different as possible. In Stampede, we, we were making sure that what we did was to make the, the interventions that we were evaluating have different modes of action or different targets that we were trying to hit. To, partly to maximize the chance and success of each individual arm, because why would you compare Tweedledee and Tweedledum in different arms? But also we know that most of our diseases require combination treatment. So if you're using interventions with different modes of action, combine, uh, you, there's a possibility that you can combine the successful interventions to have added benefit, accumulate, accumulating benefit over time. And that's what we found with Stampede. Let's just turn briefly to this issue of repurposed drugs. What do we mean by repurposed drugs? These are drugs that are already out there, are usually run out of their patent, out of license, and are widely used. And some examples are aspirin. Aspirin is used for a variety of different uh, in, uh, indications. Thalidomide was originally developed for morning sickness, now is used for leprosy and a, a number of different other um, uh, diseases, uh, and amantadine is um, now being used in Parkinson's disease, uh, sorry, um, uh, but it's been developed for a number of different other uh, interventions. Other examples of repurposed drugs are all the drugs that we're using, or many of the drugs we're using for COVID-19, Examples like dexamethasone, tocilizumab, remdesivir, they're all developed for other diseases, have been repurposed when COVID-19 came around and actually have proved very successful. And, uh, and a lot of the drugs in, for multiple sclerosis that are used for re, uh, relapsing and remitting uh, a multiple sclerosis are repurposed drugs from other diseases. So, and... What we found actually in the academic community, repurposed drugs have got a bad press. If you look at in industry, they repurpose drugs all the time. What they do is they repurpose the drug, present it in another, use the drug in another disease than the one they originally targeted, rename it and often sell it for a higher price. And that's a success. Other practical and strategic challenges are that collaboration has got to be very, very large for this sort of trial. We've got hundreds, if not thousands, of collaborators nationally and internationally. The, and the central multidisciplinary team for Stampede is probably uh, of a size greater than 100, requiring a wide range of disciplines um, uh, right across the board to make sure you can both design. Uh, conduct and deliver this sort of project. So it's a very large endeavor. The key component of it is communication, uh, both to patients, doctors, policymakers, that you need to have a communication strategy, ready planning for success of research arms, because you've got to work out how you're going to then communicate that to patients. How do you change your protocol? How do you make sure policies are changed? How do you change doctors prescribing practices? Uh, so you, that can be amended as soon as possible. And also what happens if the, the inevitably at least half your arms are going to fail? So you've got to communicate that. What does it mean for the patients on those treatments at that time? What does it mean for the future of the trial? And what does it mean for uh, the the the, the uh, patients in terms of subsequent treatments that they might use. So really quite complicated issues and communication that you need to plan for both at the beginning of the trial and during the course of the trial. Also, bizarrely, you have to plan for unplanned adaptations that as you're you're looking at the, as you're running the trial over this long period of time. Because results, for example, results from trials elsewhere, you will know and um, will emerge. And you've got to think a little bit about how you might adapt your own trial and protocol to deal with that. 
And we did that as in Stampede, a trial reporting the benefit of radiotherapy for patients with locally advanced disease came through and we changed our protocol as a consequence of that, partly because we were, we were aware that that might come through and would work through the, con the potential consequence of a positive result from that trial. There are, as I mentioned, many design and statistical challenges, which I won't talk about here. Uh, and there's a huge literature, enormous literature on this uh, now as a consequence of these designs being used. And there's a huge workload for central and hospital staff. What they're doing is juggling lots of aspects of trials all at the same time. Trials are, the components of the trials are starting new arms, Trials are, uh, you're reporting adverse events on lots of arms all at the same time. You're closing some arms at, at, at the same time. And of course, you're monitoring patients, large numbers of individuals on the trial for often long periods of time. So it's a really very challenging amount of work to do. And that's partly why you need such large teams. However, if you think of any other way you can think of doing this, you would not get those results in that period of time. And so the amount of effort and the amount of work and the amount of time and the cost are, are, are more than worth it. Uh, I've talked a little bit about industry. I'll talk a little bit more. How about industry? If you start off with repurposed or, or uh, agents which you've got off the shelf or interventions you've got, how about industry? Well, what we found, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of the film Field of Dreams, and what we found, actually, if you build this in infrastructure, they will come. And you saw all the, the, uh, the uh, uh, companies which have interacted with us on Stampede and now on other trials that we're doing, that we've built the infrastructure, they will come. And actually, you have a very strong card to play with them because the infrastructure is there and they want to help uh, 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 their own goals by tapping into it. Okay. I'd like to just, in this last part of the talk, talk a little bit about how we thought of this sort of idea now being applied in areas where there's been little or no progress for decades. Uh, and one specific area is neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, as I say, little or no progress in outcomes for many, many decades. And we're focused on four major neurodegenerative diseases, motor neuron disease, progressive multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, and dementia, to help support the development of uh, multi-arm, multi-stage platform trials in those areas. Because we need a step change in what we're doing if we're going to change outcomes in these areas in, uh, in our lifetimes. We've developed what we've called this Accord Initiative, which is a collaboration of groups developing and running and reporting multi-arm, multi-stage trials in neurodegenerative diseases. And this is a collaboration of charities and philanthropists of uh, a number of them listed at the top there. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 charities and philanthropic organizations. We've all come together to to, to uh, invest in this area. The founding partners are our, ourselves at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL, University of Edinburgh and the Institute of Neurology here at UCL, and our collaborating partners around the country, uh, including a number of academic institutions, uh, major academic institutions, which have an interest in doing trials in neurodegenerative diseases. We've all come together to, um, see if we can do better as a, as a grouping rather than as a loan. And why should we come together as a neurodegenerative disease grouping? Well, we, there are very many common elements. There are many common issues in prioritization of treatments. Potentially there's common elements in uh, what treatments might be evaluated. There's common aspects of biobanking, sample uh, analysis, what outcome measures we might use, what, how we might uh, uh, apply the new methods that we've that we've developed to data which are longitudinal in nature rather than binary or time to event data. The how we might encourage recruitment needs, how we might address the need for placebo, how we might address 
issues with chronic diseases as opposed to uh, the diseases that we have been uh, uh, applied these methods to in the past. We've also set up across the nine academic institutions, the National Academy of Accord Fellows. So 15 of fellows uh, who will be the future generation of trialists in this area across these nine institutions, all connected to these individual trials in, in MND, progressive MS, Parkinson's disease, and dementia. And we've also formed a, a statistical group across these nine collaborating institutions, all aimed at, uh, all attached to these individual large-scale collaborative trials. We're, we're also taking steps beyond Stampede to look at a more structured and systematic approach to prioritizing treatments. I'll talk a little bit about that. We'll look at specific challenges of, of how we look at prioritizing treatments and how patients can be involved. So what we're doing is adapting um, uh, the methods of prioritizing drug selection for uh, these trials looking at a number of different methods, looking at the published literature, methods of experimental drug screening, uh, looking at pathway analysis, interrogating trial databases, and including expert opinion in a systematic structured way to prioritize new agents for evaluation in the MND smart trial. We are applying this to the octopus trial in progressive multiple sclerosis. On the left-hand side, you see all of the uh, interventions that are being considered and a process that we're going through in a structured systematic way uh, uh, using these methods that I've mentioned to get a short list of winner or prioritized treatments on the right-hand side then. Where are we with Accord? We started the trial in motor neuron disease with two repurposed research arms. 400 patients from 17 centers have been recruited. The first analysis, uh, uh, first stage analysis have been done. Both arms have continued. And uh, so they are both carried on to the next stage. So we still got three arms, the control arm and the two research arms. And we're adding a new research arm next year. The, the multi-arm, multi-stage trial in progressive multiple sclerosis will be starting in late 2022, early 2023. We're just interacting with the MHRA on getting approvals for this. The Parkinson's disease trial is uh, being worked up and developed for, by a very large collaboration. And there's an aim to develop the fund and launch this in the next two years. And we're at very early stages of a discussion of a large scale trial in dementia along similar lines. I hope I've persuaded you that what we need is a step change in trial design and efficiency. Our way of doing trials in the past was going to mean that it would take us generations to make progress. Um, traditional trials, it's not the best analogy, but one analogy is like, it's like, it, it's like building a, a, a stadium, a football stadium for a single game. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you use that stadium, not only for that single game, for, but, but for many matches and also for other matches? Tottenham Hotspur actually have not only football at their stadium, they've also got a, an NFL pitch underneath it. Why wouldn't you adapt it? Multi on multi stage platform trials allows you to do many things all at the same time. Uh, they're a challenge, real challenge to design, develop, fund, and run, but they're more than worth the challenge in terms of where, we, where they get us and how quickly they get us there. Can't emphasize how much that the patient involvement is key to their development success. One group gets this and knows the importance of these things. It's the patients, and they are the best voice for these things. It's heartening to see that funders are recognizing, now recognizing their importance. And a patient, I'll finish by saying, a patient partner who I've worked with for years asked me the other day, why don't you do all your trials this way? Well, I didn't have an answer to that question. I can't really say actually the funding and the challenges are just too large. That's not really a sensible answer. I'd like to finish just with some thanks to the many, many people that I've worked with over 
decades on the ideas and designs of these, these trials, running these trials, the thousands of patients that have entered the trials and the hundreds of patients that I've worked with. And just to finish with a couple of pictures of some of the people that have involved in Stampede over many, many years. Uh, uh, and I'll stop there. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with the picture. Thank you very much. Max, thank you. That was fabulous. Fabulous science, fabulous presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I just encourage our audience, if they would like to submit questions, to go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O. Uh, there's a box there to enter the event code, and it's a hashtag prostate cancer, or lowercase, uh, one word. And uh, I'm happy to read out the questions as they come up. So, Max, uh, questions we've got so far. So, you're a statistician. I'm a simple doctor. How do you do a power calculation with something that's got five arms in it, which have different effect sizes, and and you don't know how big the controls need to be? <laughs> so, so. Okay, so that's a really good question. Is that so? One way of thinking about it, and it's to simplify this, one yeah. way of thinking about it, it's just a very efficient way of doing two arm trials. Yeah. And yeah. so what you do is you power it for each of those two arm trials. Uh, and separately, and so you can have different numbers uh, for those trials. Right, right. Uh, and and actually, that simplifies the thinking very, very well and easily. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And then you, you're, the point you made repeatedly was that patients have a central role in the design of the trials, and that they like the trials. So if you say to a patient, um, uh, you could be in a control, you could be the control arm, or you could have a treatment. That sort of makes sense in, if you're explaining a trial. You could be in the control arm, you could have been one of five different treatments. Do patients like that? Do, do, well, they, do they get that narrative? Enough, we, when we set off on this in, in the early 2000s, yeah. we, yeah. we were told we were mad and that patients, <laughs> patients and doctors would not understand this yeah. and wouldn't be able to get their heads around it. The first people who got their heads around it were the patients and said, Interesting. well, you know, this is just going to be more efficient. And a, a, an interesting side effect of this design is the likelihood that you will be allocated and, and, and research intervention is larger just because of yeah. the design. Because yeah. if you have a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one randomization, the yeah. probability of getting a, a, a research intervention is larger. And although I don't think it's a good argument, yeah. it seems that patients and doctors like that. Yeah, understood. So if you've got a three in four chance, if you've got a four-arm trial, one yeah. controlled arm, three research arms, you've got a three in four chance of getting a research arm and a one yeah. in four chance of getting control. Whereas in a standard two-arm yeah. trial, 50-50 yeah. chance. I can and see actually, that. actually, patients get it straight away and they they say, what's the beef here? Yeah, yeah. And I guess the, the, the beef is money, as you decide, because this is a... And, and the number of hundreds and hundreds of people that, and thousands of people that are involved in the, in the running of these studies is extraordinary. You must, for Stampede, maybe this is difficult, but have a have an estimate of how much money it's saved. So yeah, if you think... Well, we if you, have that. Yeah, it would, have, yeah it, would, it would have been hundreds and hundreds of millions. Yeah, because it's a fabulous, fabulous study, study design, allowing people to join and just having the study continuing with new control groups and, and, and new challenges. Yeah, it does. And, and our goal, I think, in that should be to get uh, patients with metastatic disease to have the same a prognosis when they set off as yeah. patients with non-metastatic disease with a greater chance of dying with from dying from something else than their prostate cancer yeah and, and we're and, not that far off now that yeah no it's, it's really really impressive it's re it's really really impressive and um, interestingly that the next stage are neurological diseases because uh, these are these dementias and ms and mnds and parkinson's um i would are there the common diseases that we sh that you think are ripe for this approach um i.e i mean prostate uh, prostate prostate uh, cancer is fairly fairly common there are other common diseases are there other common diseases that you would think do you know what stepping back if money was no object at all and i didn't need to build a coalition of the willing of the funders i'd go for this yes i i, I think probably um we're dealing with uh uh, we're giving advice to a, a large number of people across a range of diseases, 
but I don't see so much of this, for example, in the cardiovascular setting. Yeah, which is a, a very that, very common. Disease. Yeah, that would be an I, obvious I do, one, and, and, and you just don't know why. Why? Why not? Yeah, because the cardio skin the cardio... disease is another one. We're very very common eczema. Yeah. Etc. Um, there are very some very common diseases where you feel we should be able to make faster progress. So my my so the cardiovascular one was the one that I thought of because you know in my early days as a junior doctor I recruited to the various the various cardiovascular studies I think the, the demonstration of streptokinase was beneficial in to get to, in my cardiac infarction to give you some idea of my age Max I, I was a junior doctor recruiting to those studies but now cardiovascular diseases is, um, is so complicated it, it requires four standard of care is five drugs for example so can you do a can you do a stamp can you do a stampede tripe study when you've got that complexity, do you, do you yeah. see what I mean? You've, yeah, you just... can, you can actually, because um, uh, we're now in that place in in a number of cancers. We're now getting to that sort of stage in prostate cancer. Stampede has yeah. got there. Uh, yeah. We're in that sort of position for COVID. Yeah. Um, and with those, the studies are being done. So yes, you can, because um, in 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 some ways it's. It's no more complex than doing a two-arm trial. The complexity, if you think of it as lots of two-arm trials, yeah, it's no yeah. more complex. The complexity comes from the, 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 the central coordination of it, not at the not with the right. patient, because the, the patient only gets either one research arm or the control arm. Understood. 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 And and it doesn't matter if they're on four or five different standards of care. No, no, not at all. Because that's no. that's your that's your control, if you like. Exactly, that's your starting exactly. point. And you're adding to yeah. that. And so we are finding that in, a, in that um, uh, and in some ways that heterogeneity is helpful too, because you want to know whether your new intervention can add to all of those different standards of care. Yeah. Max, thank you. I don't think we have any other questions. So can I just finish by saying thank you very much. Uh, thanks for a brilliant, brilliant presentation, but perhaps more importantly, thanks for all your hard work, intellect and input in designing this approach, which really has revolutionised the way that we do clinical trials. So Max, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I finish by thanking our audience for, for joining, joining us today and to let you know that the next lunch hour lex lecture will be on the 22nd of November on managing COVID-19. How could we have done and do better? Thanks very much, everyone, and take care. Bye-bye.